Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome tonight to tonight's discussion, uh, Fukushima Fallout. Uh, my name is Tony Gilland. I'm the Science and Society Director at the Institute of Ideas, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this wonderful setting, the John Rylands Library, uh, for tonight's discussion. Uh, many thanks to Yvette Jill, uh, hiding away there behind the lights, so you won't be able to see her, uh, and her colleague Jackie Fortnum for hosting uh, the event tonight. Just to say, it's actually wearing many hats, this discussion. Uh, it's, I think it's rather wonderful to have so many organisations uh, involved with putting a debate such as, as this on. Uh, so as well as John Ryland's library, and you can read about all their events in the literature on your, literature on your seat, we have the Manchester Science Festival. I'm sure many of you are uh, uh, very well aware of the Manchester Science Festival, but if you're not, again, pick up the brochure on your seat. There's lots of great events uh, taking place. And thirdly, uh, it is also a Battle of Ideas satellite event, uh, which is uh, one of a series of about 20 discussions taking place around the country that are linked to the Battle of Ideas festival organized by the uh, organization I work for, the Institute of Ideas. And again, you've got a brochure on your seat. Uh, now, I know from Simon there's a, a full house, and lots of people have said how much they're looking forward to making their contributions and questions to the discussion. So I'm not going to say too much by the way of introduction. I think you're all obviously aware of the significance of the issue uh, and the way in which events in Japan early this year uh, have raised a lot of discussion and thrown the question of nuclear power into perhaps a, a different perspective, or at least for some people, uh, which is what we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, so I won't say much more than that, uh, but I would like to just offer a couple of additional thanks before introducing the panel. Um, Natalie Ireland and Emily Wiles from uh, uh, the Manchester Science Festival, thank you to them uh, for putting on such a wonderful festival and having this event as part of it. Uh, thank you to Richard Crawford, uh, who's suddenly disappeared from view. Uh, he's, there, he's there waving. Uh, Richard, uh, um, who works with AMEC, but he's organ uh, organized this event uh, in a personal capacity alongside Simon Belt uh, from the Manchester Salon, uh, which I think many of you will be uh, familiar with. And if you're not, uh, do also look up the Manchester Salon uh, on their website and, and take part in their further discussions. Very pleased to have Nuclear Liaison TV uh, here, and you can see all the, the cameras. So when it comes to the discussion, you will be filmed, and we will ask you to stand up and speak into the microphone if you wouldn't mind. And that's the benefit uh, for other people to enjoy this debate uh, when it's broadcast on uh, their website uh, in a, uh, a short while. Finally, then, to introduce our speakers. First to speak, very pleased to have Dr. John Roberts. Uh, furthest away from me on my right, who's a nuclear fellow at the Dalton Nuclear Institute at the University of Manchester and a visiting academic in the Department of Materials at Imperial College London. He teaches on nuclear master's courses at Manchester, Surrey and Southampton. Uh, so welcome to John. Next to John, very pleased to have Dame Sue Eon, who is a non-executive director of the board of the Laboratory of the UK Health and Safety Executive. Um, she was a member of the UK Council for Science and Technology from 2004 to 2011, also a member of the Particle Physics and Astronomy Research Council, and uh, also a member of the EPSRC, uh, the Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council, if I get that correct. Uh, and she chairs the Fusion Advisory Board for the Research Councils and previously was uh, the Group Director of Technology uh, for BNFL, British Nuclear Fuels. So very well equipped to be on the panel, so welcome to Sue. Finally, very pleased to have on my left Rob Lyons, uh, who is the Deputy Editor of the online journal Spiked, uh, which is a, a spiky online journal that causes controversy with its uh, interesting opinions and insights. So if you haven't read it before, do look it up. He takes uh, uh, the attitude, uh, Rob does, as does his magazine, uh, that humanity is underrated. Uh, so you can uh, find out what he thinks about humanity being underrated uh, very shortly uh, in relation to the nuclear issue. But he also has a particular interest in the environmental issues more broadly, food and uh, risk. And he has a book out just this month published by uh, uh, Societas uh, called Panic on a Plate how society developed an eating disorder. So if you've ever panicked about anything you've eaten or uh, what you should and shouldn't be eating, then I can recommend Rob's book to you. Okay, 
Now, before we be begin the discussion, uh, very pleased to ask Stephen Perver, who's a science writer, to step up uh, to the audience, please, in front of the audience. Uh, Stephen is going to uh, uh, say a few words about why he was involved in uh, putting on tonight's discussion as well, uh, just to set the context before we begin. Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I was just asked to um, put the later debate that we're going to have into some context by reminding everybody about the actual natural disaster that occurred in Japan that, of course, prompted the issue we're talking about tonight. Um, so, obviously, as you probably remember, on the 11th of March, there was a huge earthquake in Japan which measured 9.0 on the Richter scale. The um, US Geological Survey reckons there's about one earthquake of size 8 or higher every year somewhere in the world. Of course, Japan is quite seismically active as well, but um, nevertheless, this earthquake was one of the top five ever recorded. Um, and it was particularly devastating because the epicenter was in the ocean and it created a large tsunami wave that impacted on the northeastern coast of Japan. And it was that that caused the huge damage and loss of life. Indeed, 16,000 people estimated were killed and almost 6,000 were injured. Thousands more are still unaccounted for, presumed dead. Um, you know, whole communities were destroyed um, by this, this event and uh, there were around 4.4 million households in northeastern Japan without electricity, 1.5 million without water afterwards. And it's estimated that the whole disaster is going to cost the Japanese economy around 300 billion US dollars, which will make it the most costly natural disaster in history. Now, given these statistics, the international media coverage was obviously extensive. Um, but one issue swiftly rose to dominate above all others, and that was the issue of the damage to the Fukushima nuclear power plant. If you track the focus of the online coverage in the days after the disaster, you can quickly see the Fukushima issue dominating the international English language news stations and uh, online versions of newspapers. If you um, look now, seven months on, the coverage is almost universally devoted to Fukushima and the wider nuclear debate. Uh, for example, BBC News or The Guardian, to name but two websites, have sections devoted to the earthquake. But if you actually look at those, really what they're talking about is the nuclear issue. The wider humanitarian crisis seems to have been somewhat lost. And you can contrast that with the um, English language Japan Times, for example, which has a much broader level of coverage about the whole issue happening in Japan at the moment. Now, obviously, the reason for the focus isn't particularly surprising. We are talking about what has been rated as the most severe nuclear incident since Chernobyl. But also, perhaps, the reason for the continuing debate is that governments like Germany and Japan have decided that they're going to phase out nuclear technology altogether and China is also reviewing its position, while France and the UK have reaffirmed their commitment to the technology. But maybe another reason, perhaps the most pressing reason, is the fear that seems to be engendered by the issue of nuclear power in the public or at large. I was um, travelling last year and I went to Japan shortly after the earthquake, about a month afterwards. Um, and I was in New Zealand when it happened and speaking to other travellers, most of them said that they were not going to go to Japan, even if they'd been planning to before. And the reason, almost universally, was the fear of widespread nuclear contamination. Now, I, I did go. I went and uh, visited the, the south of the country, which was obviously a fair distance away from, from the disaster zone and, and not really affected. But you could see, even there, in cities like Hiroshima and Kyoto, that there were not at all many tourists about, and a lot of guest houses and places that I stayed were, were almost empty. And speaking to, to people in Japan about this, which of course can be difficult with the, the language issue, it seemed as though, while there was obviously concern about the, um, the Fukushima question, there were wider concerns about the economic impact on the country that perhaps weren't really reported in the international news. And certainly a lot of the people I spoke to who were in the tourist industry were, were very worried about 
the effect that it would have on the reputation of Japan. So, we'll start the main debate. I think what I've just tried to do is remind you that whilst we're talking about a specific issue and the fallout from it, if I can describe it in that way, there was a wider and uh, very, very severe natural disaster that occurred that prompted it. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen, very much. So thank you, Stephen, uh, for setting out that context, and I think a very important point for us to consider in this discussion. Uh, we'll now move on to the speaker's comments. Just to say, uh, the style of uh, a, a nature of event that I'm used to chairing is to try and give the speakers a hard time. Uh, not because I'm impolite, but because I think that way we can hopefully learn a bit more uh, from their expertise and, and what they're saying by stirring it up. So I'll let the speakers make their opening comments, then I'm going to try and give them a, a few tough questions each to consider, uh, and then we'll go over to all of you in the audience for your points and questions. Just as a, a point of interest, can I get a quick show of hands? Who in the audience is sceptical at the moment about the benefits of nuclear power? A small number. And who is optimistic about the benefits of nuclear power? Right, OK, well, that's just useful to get an indication of where the audience is at. So we've got quite a lot of optimists, but we look forward to hearing from absolutely everyone uh, uh, in the audience. OK, John, uh, would you like to kick us off, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, good evening. Um, as has just been described, the situation in that part of Japan was absolutely devastating to the local communities. But as the focus has been on Fukushima, then we have found a lot about Fukushima. And perhaps one of the most startling things to many commentators is that despite the predictions of meltdown, and I'm not even sure they understood exactly what they were talking about when they talked about meltdown, uh, there have been no deaths attributable to the release of radiation from Fukushima. And there are predicted to be no deaths from the release of radiation moving forward through time. So I think that's a very important uh, statement to make right at the beginning that we do not expect Fukushima to result in any deaths. And if we look at major accidents in the nuclear industry uh, prior to Fukushima, then the number of deaths are very small compared to other industries. In fact, all the figures uh, point to nuclear being a very safe way of generating electricity. If you look at coal, for example, uh, there are about 161 deaths per terawatt hour of electricity produced by coal. And compare that to nuclear, it's only 0.04 deaths per terawatt hour. A significant more number of deaths uh, result from coal use for producing electricity than they do for uh, nuclear. So perhaps that's kind of not people's perception of the nuclear industry. We also look at Fukushima as a kind of reactor that was built and designed in the 1960s. And in the UK, as in many countries around the world, we're on the cusp of this nuclear renaissance. And we want to make sure that we talk about nuclear reactors that are going to be built in the 21st century in the way we would talk about cars that are designed in the 21st century or other machinery or industrial devices. We are not planning on building 1960s designed nuclear reactors as we wouldn't build 1960s designed cars in the 21st century. So it's very important to note that these reactors have evolved over the last 40 or 50 years. And one of those evolutionary areas is, of course, safety. So the nuclear reactors that we'll be building today in the UK are very different from those that were built in Japan in the 1960s. Other aspects of the accident that kind of led people to be fearful was this problem of uh, radiation. Lots of commentators in the media, yet again, didn't fully understand radiation and the concepts such as half-life and that the radiation would die away. Some radiation would die away within minutes, some within days, some are perhaps a bit longer. And my personal feeling is that we do not do a good enough job of educating people, whether they are people in the street or people in politics or people in positions of power, regarding radiation. Statements like radiation is dangerous are very negative and completely wrong. We live in a radiation field all the time. There is no such thing as a radiation-free world. We would have to move around in a lead-blind box for it to be true. Everywhere we go, we are kind of subject to this radiation field. If we take holidays and we fly, then we increase our radiation dose. If we go to certain parts of the world, we increase our radiation dose. But we're able to measure our background dose just by everyday existence of living in a part of the world, 
eating types of food, drinking different types of liquid. So that radiation is everywhere. And we must do a better job of educating the people around that there is a certain level of radiation which is quite safe for us to exist in. So I'd just like to end on the key aspect of education. One thing I'd like to see from uh, the Fukushima incident and the focus on it is perhaps uh, more investment in educating people around radiation and nuclear energy. And perhaps as we move forward, people will be less fearful of the consequences of radiation because they live with radiation every day of their lives. Okay, thank you, John. Sue, please, and could you just move the microphone closer? Sure. Thanks. Okay, well, I mean, prior to the events at uh, Fukushima, or rather the Tohoku earthquake um, and subsequent tsunami, because there's a really important difference there, and I think Stephen highlighted that at the beginning when he spoke, there was a growing consensus that uh, nuclear should form part of the energy mix in many countries um, in the earth going forward. And that, interestingly, still remains the case today. You know, positive observation post Fukushima with the passage of time has been the willingness of governments worldwide, with one notable exception, Germany, um, and the general populace to take account of facts and analysis rather than jump to preemptive negative action. I mean, even in Japan, um, you know, the authorities are struggling with the rationale of trying to um, build confidence back in their populace that it's okay to continue to operate the reactors that are still perfectly capable of operating in Japan and still are delivering electricity to the Japanese grid. But one of the key issues coming from the events at Fukushima and the northeast coastal area of Japan was the importance of getting factual information across and trying to mitigate the general media reaction to report a nuclear catastrophe. I mean, like many um, with um, uh, skills in the sector, um, I was chased all over the UK and beyond for the first fortnight after Fukushima by the broadcast media and the print media wanting quotes about how the catastrophe was going to unfold and being very disappointed um, on a discussion that said, well, actually, you know, even if it's as bad as it could possibly get, it still won't be that bad. You know, they just didn't want to know that at all. So there's a big education um, a step to take forward, I think, um, as, as John has indicated. But the catastrophe that is still there in Japan is to do with the hundreds of miles of total devastation and the thousands, tens of thousands, killed and missing, which still remains the case today. Nothing to do with the reactors at, um, at Fukushima or the radiation. So Fukushima is actually, uh, rather than being negative, is a testimony to actually the robustness of the technology that was 40 years old. You know, it survived in the face of the worst natural, unprecedented natural disaster it could have had. Yes, the damage will require remediation, but it's an economic and an engineering issue rather than one associated with, with radiation um, and long-term impact on, on the populace. So internationally, there's been a lot of analysis by the international regulators, and most countries have concluded that it's perfectly safe to continue to operate what they've got and to plan to build new ones. Here in the UK, our own chief nuclear inspector came out with his final report a fortnight ago that said just that. No reason not to continue to operate our current plants, and we should continue with intentions to replace them. So there's over 400 reactors operating worldwide as we speak. In the UK, they provide 18% of our electricity. Back in the early 1990s, they actually provided 30% of our electricity when they were all running before they started to retire and when demand was slightly less than it is now. In France, 80% of the electricity is provided by nuclear energy. In the United States, 20%. And it varies from country to country. Even with Fukushima, there are 62 new nuclear reactors currently under construction worldwide. There's 154 firm orders in the books of the major providers, and there's a, hundred, a further 342 in long-term plans. So, you know, nuclear energy is continuing um, worldwide, even with Fukushima. But the bigger question is, you know, what do we care about um, in terms of uh, future generations and our own um, lifestyle? You know, if we care about the security of our energy supplies, if we care about the affordability of electricity, and if we care about reducing the UK's carbon emissions, never mind about the world ones, then whilst there's no alternative to very significant increases in the amount of renewables, there's also no alternative to continuing to have nuclear energy in the mix. As part of a Royal Academy of Engineering team, we looked at what is it feasible to build, what's the maximum you could possibly build in terms of 
um, renewable energy between now and 2050. And we worked out you'd need 30, this is the maximum you can get away with building. You know, it's not engineering wise possible to build anymore. You'd need 38 London arrays, we haven't got one yet, and each one occupies about 200 square miles of, uh, of sea. A thousand miles of Palamis wave machines, that's the equivalent of building three miles a month for the next 40 years, you know, tube trains worth a day for the next 40 years. 10,000 land-based um, wind turbines over and above that which we've got. 25 million solar panels. The seven barrage built, but we've already decided not to, and I, I could go on. But as well as those renewable installations, which we do, mean, do need, you'd also need 40. That's four zero new nuclear plants in the United Kingdom to meet those targets. Because we're in the business of decarbonizing our economy. If we're going to stop driving around and using petrol and diesel and move to electric cars and other means of, uh, of propulsion and we're going to take gas boilers out of our homes and go back to electricity, then the demand for electricity is going to double or treble over the next two decades, two to three decades. And in that case, you need 40 nuclear power plants in your mix. So the engineering challenge is absolutely massive. Not only the stations themselves, but the, the national grid has got to be upgraded and, uh, and rein, reinforced. So a 21st century society like ours needs electricity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 de days a year. We've got a massive challenge ahead to keep our lights on and our society running. It's not like the 1970s where you could make do with rolling blackouts and it'd be you know, a bit of a challenge, but okay. With the amount of computers and stuff like that that we all rely on to control our lives, we have to have electricity down those wires 24-7, 365. So the key questions that people tend to focus on, you know, is nuclear energy safe? Well, yes, it is. The new systems on offer are even safer, as John has indicated, than the existing ones, which are already safe. Technology hasn't stood still. You know, the preferred systems... Um, offered by the top utilities now have passive safety, um, which means you don't need active intervention to keep them safe. Is it low carbon? Yes, it's comparable with wind when you count everything, everything um, that you need to make sure that you deliver electricity from it. Is it economic? Yes, it is, taking account of even the waste management and decommissioning. It's comparable with, comparable with gas. It's better if the price of gas goes any higher, or if gas has to have carbon capture and sequestration associated with it, it's better than coal already. And it's much cheaper than offshore wind, which is two to three times at least more expensive. Now, our utilities are all, in the main, foreign-owned utilities, private sector. They've all bought land and are progressing nuclear projects here in the UK, including E.ON and RWE, the two big German utilities, intending to build nuclear stations on Anglesey to replace Wilfer. Those private sector utilities would not invest in nuclear energy in the UK if it wasn't economic. They just wouldn't. So in the post-Fukushima era, as far as I'm concerned, we can have confidence that nuclear energy is safe, it's secure, and it's affordable as a form of energy for the 21st century. And that the modern plants that are available for the UK to deploy should be a part of our mix going forward. If you think back to last year, you know, I'm sure most of you can remember December and how cold it was. 7th of December, 6 o'clock at night. Where do you think your electricity came from? Because it certainly didn't come from photovoltaics and it certainly didn't come from wind. Your electricity came 39% from coal, 39% from gas, 16% from the UK's nuclear stations, 2% from the French nuclear stations supplying power under the channel. The rest came from pump storage and emergency switched on oil. So just think about where your electricity came from. We can't keep the lights on here in the UK without nuclear energy. I want my lights to stay on. I want my house to be warm, as I'm sure you do, and my trains to run and be on time. And I want to use all those 21st century gadgets like iPods and iPhones when I want to and when I need to. We've benefited for over 50 years from low carbon electricity generated from nuclear. So we shouldn't abandon it. It's essential. And since most of our existing reactors are going to retire over the next 10, 15 years, it's vital we get on building new ones here in the UK as soon as possible. OK, thank you very much, Sue. OK, last to uh, speak, then Rob, please. 
this is the danger of coming after the nuclear experts. They'd say all the things that you were going to say. Um, for me, the, uh, I think Stephen did a very good job at the start there of, um, of putting the whole thing into pers perspective. Um, I mean, it's clear that the lesson of Fukushima is just how astonishingly safe nuclear power is. You can take what is basically the nuclear reactor equivalent of a Ford Cortina, sort of like 1970s uh, technology, uh, or in fact 1960s design, throw at it about as bad an event as you can get, and the result of it has not been uh, at all serious, really, in terms of human life or in long-term human health. Um, it, is, it has created a mess that's going to take a long time to clear up. It's going to be a, a real, real pain to clear up. But it's a as has been said, it's a technical and an engineering problem rather than a, 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 a matter of, of safety. And is actually something that concerns me is that the, the way in which the discussion in the West has focused so much on what's happened at the nuclear power plant rather than the devastation that's happened all along that coast of Japan. And it seems to me quite narcissistic, really, that the, you know, the, the, political, and the, media, uh, the political debate and the media coverage has, has really been all about us and not about Japan. Um, I think perspective is uh, very important here. So um, by a long way, the world's worst nuclear, well, civilian nuclear accident uh, was Chernobyl in 1986. Um, and if you, I mean, a lot of people spent a lot of time talking about how Fukushima wasn't Chernobyl. Well, in, in many ways, Chernobyl wasn't Chernobyl because it doesn't match up to the, the, the fears that people have or the idea that they have about it. So, uh, I mean, I, for a, for journalistic reasons, I visited uh, Chernobyl in January this year, and you would be given the impression that kind of after that accident, that uh, they kind of put a lid on it, shut the door, and then ran away 30 kilometres and have stayed there ever since, and it's, the place has been sort of kind of a nuclear desert. Um, but when I visited, there were still hundreds of people working there pretty much full time, uh, mostly working on clearing down the, you know, continuing to clear up the mess. But um, what was surprising in reading about it was just how that before the end of 1986, the Chernobyl plant was, was producing electricity again. And they only stopped producing electricity in the year 2000, partly because of international pressure to uh, kind of twisting the Ukrainian government's arm into kind of uh, offering the exchange of help with finally clearing things up um, in exchange for shutting it down. Um, and bizarrely enough, the Chernobyl accident was a result of a safety test. So you really can be too careful sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think John made very good points about the, about the safety of, of nuclear. Uh, so, for example, we, uh, around about this time last year, we had the, the, the disaster at the New Zealand's Pike River mine, which killed 29 people. Very fortunately, those 33 Chilean miners did get out of that mine. Um, but in China, as many as 7,000 miners have died in a year um, because of the, 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 the lack of safety in that. We would accept the coal industry as a perfectly reasonable uh, industry and a very important industry. And in fact, the world's worst energy-related uh, energy disaster um, was, in, of all things, a hydroelectric scheme in China in 1975 when a dam broke there. 171,000 people died as a result of that. So that really does put uh, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and everything else very much into perspective. Um, so it's not a question of safety. Um, I think it's about two things. It's about our reaction to nuclear power, and it's about our willingness of, the willingness of our politicians to show leadership on this question. I mean, there, there is a sort of long-standing uh, nervousness about nuclear power. Obviously, there is all the, the, the connotations and the associations with uh, military uses of nuclear power, but in a way those should be ancient history uh, and, and, and yet they still seem to ling linger on. There does seem to be a, a, a real fear about interfering with nature too much and nuclear along with um, genetics and nanotechnology seems to be these areas where people kind of react a little bit like you've taken it too far, we're interfering too much. I mean, maybe we can look into that uh, a bit more in the discussion. And there is also a sense that nuclear suffers from uh, a more general problem of a lack of trust both in corporations and in uh, governments. I mean, the popular coverage of nuclear power now is, uh, is not like gleaming white electricity generating you know, marvels, but 
Monty Burns and The Simpsons, you know, they're being quite happy to like pollute the rest of the town and uh, ha having your safety manager as Homer Simpson, you know, that's the kind of a, a certain image that's being created of, of, of what nuclear power is all about. So that's, you know, there is a popular uh, nervousness about it, but I think that that's actually very much overstated. Um, I think more people are open to the idea of nuclear power than are given credit for. At the same time, there is a political problem uh, in that the, an unwillingness of uh, governments to actually sort of grasp the metal on this one. Um, certainly in the, in the case of the UK, we've had a situation where we've, we've gone from a Labour government that was against it, against it, against it, all right, maybe, but just possibly to a, like, Libcon government that's now saying, yes, we'll, um, we'll probably provide some, like, set up the market so it makes it easier for it to happen. But when you've got Chris Hewn as your energy secretary, you know, a man who's got a track record of being against nuclear, you can see that, that any support is still going to be tepid and there's going to be an awful lot of foot dragging on the issue. So I, I very much hope that there are nuclear power stations get replaced by shining new ones. Uh, but at the same time, I'm... I'm nervous that this, this, whether this will ever actually happen. I, I'll, you know, I'll only be happy when they, start, they actually flick the power, power switch and turn the things on. And in other countries, obviously, even like a country like uh, of Germany, where you know, Angela Merkel is you know, a physicist by training, she's a, uh, has previously supported nuclear power, she has felt unable to sort of hold the line on that issue and has kind of caved into um, pressure from uh, green protesters there. And I think that that's, you know, I think that's a real, real shame. And the irony is, obviously, that the result will be the production of far more greenhouse gases to provide Germany's electricity than would have been the case if they stuck with nuclear. Um, zip, 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 zip. So, Sue did a very good job as, as well of explaining the, the tricky situation that we're faced with, is that we are not only having to expand do the, the normal expansion of electricity and energy requirements that, we, that a growing economy implies. But at the same time, a lot of our plants is coming to the end of its life. Not just nuclear, actually, but coal as well, in the sense that we've decided to uh, phase out voluntarily uh, or br bring it uh, to an end early uh, the life of a, a number of uh, old school kind of coal power stations because of, uh, of, of climate change. The problem is that we just really haven't got um, the alternatives to replace them. It, I, I mean, I think most people would think wind and solar would be a great idea in principle. You know, you just you know, build it, switch it on, and just let it produce power from, from nature. It sounds great, but in, in reality, um, it takes up an awful lot of space. It's not very reliable, and it is, at the moment, uh, very expensive. I think there are ways around those problems eventually, but they are not there as yet, and they won't be there for quite some time to come. So nuclear, I think, is going to be very, very important in the future, and I think we really do need to grasp the nettle and get on with building some of these stations, not just to replace the ones that we've got, but as Sue said, if we're going to switch to having electric cars and uh, we're going to use electricity for heating and, and, and so on, then we, we really need to get to build a lot more nuclear stations. That said, I would be much more open, perhaps, than others would be. It would be an interesting point to, uh, to discuss that... Um, the, the kind of the dash for gas that we had in the 90s, where we started replacing coal, partly for political reasons, with gas and, and saw a big reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is something that we should consider going further with in the future. I think there's a lot of advantages to uh, gas, particularly the, the shower gas uh, discoveries that are being made at the moment. Um, we need all the energy we can get uh, to, to, to solve all the problems of the future, and we certainly shouldn't allow... Um, either you know, the perception of public fear, and I think it's more of a perception than reality, and political weakness at the top, getting in the way of providing the vital energy that we need to move society forward. Okay, thank you, Rob, and thank you to all three of you. Um, so just to put a couple of questions to you myself, and then we'll uh, take points from uh, the audience. I want to ask you, Sue, because you deal with a lot of politicians, I imagine, and a lot of policymakers, what have you. Uh, John really uh, emphasised the importance of education, and if, we, if people were more understanding of the nature of radiation and, and uh, how it works and exposure from different things, you wouldn't have the anxiety. But when you look at the huge response, albeit maybe in the media, uh, to what happened in Japan, and the enormous amount of coverage and, and, and anxiety expressed, Somehow, I'm not convinced that education is, the, is, is just going to cut through that. So how do you see shifting perceptions and, uh, 
uh, yeah, what is the role for politicians in all this? Rob was being critical of the political leadership. You were saying they've actually held their nerve. But what is the role for politicians in dealing with that anxiety? Mm, tricky one, that. I mean, I guess the, the role of politicians, if they're, uh, if they're good politicians, is to try and, uh, and wait for some evidence and uh, analysis, um, even when it's very difficult for them to do so. And so not do a Mrs Merkel, but actually do a David Cameron or a Chris Hoon, um, who decided to wait until they were sure of the facts before uh, they were going to take any preemptive action when it didn't seem sensible to take preemptive action. And there was no reason whatsoever why Germany should switch its nuclear power stations off. You know, there wasn't going to be an earthquake or a tsunami anywhere near them. Um, so that was kind of a, an interesting political uh, reaction that was taken. Um, it's difficult to see how you, you get around those because in some circumstances you will take decisions for political expediency. There's no doubt about it. That's the way politics is. Um, but in terms of media reaction, um, I think it's just a symptom of 24, uh, 24 hour permanent news media. You know, whatever is uh, the topic of the day gets a 24 hour focus. And so, you know, they're desperate for something happening to get the cameras out there and the people out there to speak to them. Um, I just think, uh, I know you said education isn't the only way, but it's certainly part of the way to try and put things into context, um, you know, so that people understand that you get more radiation going for a CAT scan than you would sitting next to Fukushima in Japan as we speak today. Um, so to try and put things into perspective, try and put it in nuclear issues into perspective with um, other forms of, um, of catastrophe, um, which actually have a, a much more devastating long-term effect. Okay, and just very quickly on that last point, if I can ask you to address, they, the, you say other forms of catastrophe. Now, one of the things that's been commented on a, a bit, and it's something that comes up quite a bit uh, on articles that I've read on Rob's website, Spiked, is about a culture of fear, that today there's a lot of anxiety about a lot of different uh, things, and we have a culture of fear. And one of the arguments that has, has been made for nuclear is to combat the threat of climate change. And there's kind of almost a sense of, well, here's a potential ca catastrophe that trumps your fears about nuclear. Do you think there's a danger that in, in advocating nuclear, too much has been done or, uh, in terms of advocating it in the context of being a, you know, the answer to this potential catastrophe that's big in our minds, rather than perhaps a more sober, this is how it works, this is what the benefits are, this is what it costs, this is why we should be doing it. Do you think there's been a bit of a, a cheap trick, if you like, being played uh, to try and win people over that perhaps isn't so clever after all? Uh, I mean, you, you, you may have a, a point there, Tony. Um, but um, one of the issues of climate change, um, which is important, um, and I think it's important that um, the developed world actually takes it seriously and takes steps to, to do something about it, is that for many people, particularly in the West, it is a distant issue. You know, it's not for now, it's not for tomorrow, um, and it's probably having more impact somewhere else in the world rather than here in Manchester. And so the immediacy of the issue is, is not the driver. So I, I don't think it does drive people's decision-making um, or views all that much. I mean, it's something they take into account. I personally think the issue of security of supply is actually one that resonates more with people than does climate change. You know, they actually have noticed that their gas bills have gone through the roof. They have clocked the fact that we're now importers of gas. Um, you know, they have clocked the fact there's instability in Russia and the Middle East. And, you know, there might be an issue about getting the gas to the UK in the end and hence the electricity down, down the wires. So people care more about whether the lights are on than climate change, I think. OK, thank you. And John, I mean... You, I, I was you know, questioning your emphasis on education, but how happy are you with the job that politicians are doing uh, uh, for you know, putting the case uh, for nuclear? I mean, Rob referenced the previous government you know, not really wanting to go there and slowly moving in that direction. Do you think the politicians are uh, uh, advocates of nuclear? Or do they understand the Yeah, issue? I think for the first time in perhaps a long time, all three parties are agreeing on... Yeah, the, the need for nuclear electricity in the UK. It's a quite an unusual situation that we find ourselves in. You wouldn't have thought this would be the case if the Liberal Democrats were in opposition. Um, so they've come around to the fact that they've got decision-making uh, responsibility and therefore they'll be you know, relying on nuclear to contribute to the electricity mix. So they have kind of stated that they want to uh, come into that kind of you know, nuclear thinking. The other problem, I think, is that if you have 
a large proportion of the population not studying physical sciences up to age 16, that will carry on through into the politicians. So if the politicians don't have the basic understanding of physical sciences or maths, for example, mm -hmm. they will not be able to understand the, the kind of arguments on which our, all our choices for electricity are based. So we need to make sure that we not only educate them on nuclear, but we educate them on a broad range of engineering and science-based issues to make sure the people with the, the power to make the decisions fully understand the implications of what they do. We've seen the situation in Germany where, in my view, unfortunately, it's, it's kind of been a pressurised political decision, not based on you know, science or engineering-based reality. And I'm not sure what's going to happen in Germany over the next few years, whether it's going to be a situation where they are importing far more expensive electricity from other countries than they can produce from their nuclear power plants, or they're going to kind of have this complete kind of situation where they're going to have these blackout situations. If you compare the UK, and this is where it comes down to this issue of security of supply again, if you compare the UK um, electricity prices to France, for example, France has been a lot more stable over the last few years, probably due to their kind of dependence on 80% or thereabouts nuclear energy. It's a lot more stable. It doesn't fluctuate as much as our dependence on gas. So if the politicians looked at it both from a scientific, engineering and economic point of view, then they should come to the decision that nuclear's got a place to play in the electricity mix. Okay, and would you be uh, happy with, with uh, a lot more gas as well? I mean, your, your, your nuclear's got a place, but at the same time, there does seem a lot of interesting opportunities in relation to gas uh, and the opportunities to the, cheaply reduce. Yeah. The, the, the interest from the markets in gas is that it is cheap to put on the grid. It's very quick and very cheap to put on the grid. So they can have a cheap, uh, quick turnaround for their profit. It's going to be with us for a long time. We're not going to degasify our electricity mix for a number of years to come. So if you can find ways of carbon sequestration, which is going to boost the price up considerably, unfortunately, then gas is going to be around a lot longer. It's, it's not going to disappear. We're not going to radically change our electricity market over the next couple of decades. It's going to be there over that period of time and probably a lot longer. OK, thank you, John. So, Rob, education is the answer. We, 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 we're pretty much agreed here on the panel. Nuclear is an uh, important part uh, of our energy mix. Most people are, you know, it seems that politicians are responding quite sensibly to Fukushima, mm. but we could do with some more education. Uh, would you be happy with that? Is that, do you think that will... Uh... Well, I'm not against education. I think it's a very good thing. But the, uh, I mean, at the same time, it does kind of uh, underestimates, I think, the, the, the political problems. I mean, as John says, I mean, we, we, we're in a, in a very peculiar situation for the first time in a long time in Britain where the major parties are all... Uh, backing nuclear, but even that, then I just think that there's 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 so many ways in which this process could get slowed down, unfortunately, through the, through the planning system or, or through various uh, court judgments or whatever. Yeah, I think that you know that there's plenty of uh, vested interests in, in in slowing things down. Um, I think education is important, but I think uh, uh, there is a broader problem which governments face, yeah, you know, ac across the whole range of, of issues of trust. And uh, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, governments are not widely trusted anymore. I mean, particularly on nuclear, where there has been in the past because of its associations, um, and, you know, quite a lot of you know secrecy about uh, and uh, both about what's going on and about the cost, how much it was costing. So, I mean, that is a problem. I mean, I just think that the, at the end of the day, we need to win a political argument that this is really important and it, and it needs to happen. And I think the things that Sue pointed to in terms of actually emphasising the benefits of nuclear in the sense that this can make a real difference in terms of price stability, security of supply, you know, th thinking more broadly about, about, about the problems that the country faces in the future and, and our need for vast uh, uh, new supplies of energy in the future... Um, that those are the things that need to be emphasised, yeah, and we do need uh, very clear political leadership from the top to drive this through. Okay, thank you. Right, I think we should hear from the audience uh, and hear uh, what points you would like the panel to consider, what questions you have. Uh, so who would like to speak? And then we have a microphone for you. And if you wouldn't mind when you speak, uh, standing up so that the camera can capture you. But if you don't want to be on camera, you can remain sitting. That's fine. 
Would anyone like to uh, offer a thought or comment? Yes, please, at the front. Hello, uh, my name's Mark Arup. Uh, so you mentioned about all these other uh, alternative so-called green technologies that we'd need alongside 40 nuclear power stations. <clears throat> but if we did away with that uh, renewable tranche, how many more nuclear power stations would we need? I mean, are you actually bothered about alternative, well, the green sources of uh, power? Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to uh, uh, give the impression that you should do without those. I, I, it was as well as, not instead of. Um, so, I mean, it's important that we actually do benefit from the wind resource that we have around the coast of the UK and the marine resource because it helps um, with the mix. I don't, put in, don't think putting all your eggs in one basket of any technology is a good idea. So it was nuclear as well as all those renewable technologies. If you couldn't put any of those renewable technologies down which is kind of uh, not really where we're going because we're already building quite a lot of, of offshore wind um, and trying to deploy marine, then you'd probably need more like 60 new nuclear power stations. So given that you said that the renewables were two to three times more expensive, and given that I think we could accept the argument don't put all your eggs in one basket, but surely that would then suggest that there should be a lot more emphasis uh, from nu on, on nuclear, that, that in terms of the mix that you've given out a long list of uh, renewable, uh, ambitious engineering programs, isn't that actually just uh, uh, politicians playing politics and saying, well, we need to be talking about these big, ambitious, renewable programs because it's very controversial and a lot of people are very, uh, particularly those that are good at capturing media attention, uh, are very agitated about this. So we'll push ahead with some of these big programs but actually, isn't the more sensible, keep the lights on, uh, 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 have affordable energy prices? If what you say is true about nuclear, wouldn't we, shouldn't we be saying, let's put a lot more investment and resource into nuclear and emphasize the renewables far less? That's a kind of challenging viewpoint um, in today's environment. <laughs> If all, if all you cared about was uh, economics and the cheapest form of electricity generation, then you would put a lot more eggs in the nuclear basket. You would, yeah. So um, what's the advantage of the renewables, given that they both have similar CO2 counts? They do, but uh, the benefit that you get from some renewables on the mix is that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. So that if you were ever faced with... Um, a generic issue that meant you had to shut down your nuclear power plants, you would have some other means of generating energy. Right. Are there generic issues? Not, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, do we have an, uh, an, another point or question? Particularly, somebody, uh, a number of people who were sceptical about uh, uh, nuclear and be very, very keen to hear from people sceptical about nuclear. Yes, there's a lady there. Uh, what about the disposal of the waste produced from nuclear power? What about the long-term effects of that on the environment? Okay, thanks. Yes. No, I, just, I don't know. No. I just, I'm interested to hear. Great question. Thank you. Okay, who, who knows about nuclear waste? John, do you want to start? Yeah, um, the, the nuclear industry probably knows more about its waste than any other industry uh, in the country or globally. So as a very good inventory, uh, which has been developed since the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority took control of the civilian uh, nuclear waste. So the NDA have responsibility for decommissioning the first fleet of reactors, which is the Magnox reactors, and some research sites around the UK. So we look at the waste as a kind of a, an issue across different types of radioactivity. So there is high level waste, which is the most radioactive, there's intermediate and then there's low-level waste. Low-level waste is presenting a problem of volume. So we are increasing the um, low-level waste repository volume at uh, near Drig, and the high-level waste presents as a problem of radioactivity. About 95% of the radioactivity is contained in the high-level waste volume, but that volume uh, is only about 1,000 cubic metres. 95% of the volume is contained in the low-level waste volume. So we've got two kind of separate issues that we have to deal with. The UK has a legacy waste as well, because we have a kind of a programme going back to 
uh, development of plutonium for uh, nuclear weapons. We have some legacy waste from those research reactors that produce that plutonium. If you look at other countries like Sweden, they have far better characterised waste because they only have a civilian nuclear programme. So their waste issues are very much small in volume and very much small in quantity and type. So the UK is probably comparable only to the US in the types of waste and quantity that it has um, to look after. But we have technological ways of immobilising all those wastes now, either through uh, chemical means or physical compaction. So the waste issue is one that we can deal with technologically. We just need a final decision on whether we are going to uh, put the waste into interim storage, which means we're going to store it on the surface for a long period of time, or whether we're going to go for final disposal. The UK set up a committee on radioactive waste management, which reported that their preferred solution was for final disposal in an engineered repository. So the UK government, through the NDA and their Radioactive Waste Management Directorate, are now discussing the options with volunteer communities following the uh, programme of volunteerism from Finland and Sweden to look at communities which will volunteer to host a geological disposal facility. Once that community has been identified, then there'll be geological tests taking place on that rock to make sure it's suitable for disposal and then ultimately the waste will be in place for disposal and possibly all done by about 100 years time from now. Okay, and uh, Rob, you wanted to... So, sorry, yeah. Tony, if I can just a comment. In terms of the, of the high level waste that John was, uh, was talking about, um, it would fit in this building. It would fit in this room. So the volumes that we're talking about in terms of high level waste which is the very radioactive um, sort of waste that last, will last for a long time, will actually fit in this room. Um, and that's got to be dealt with. It's waste from our legacy, and um, we have to deal with that whether we have new nuclear power or not. The high volume of um, low-level waste and, and intermediate-level waste, again, the, the total quantity for the UK's historical generation of, uh, of nuclear power would fit in five Albert Hall's worth, but it's low and intermediate level waste. It is not high level waste. Um, and if you think of any industrial process, any um, uh, thing that we do as a population, it, we generate waste. It, you know, it goes to landfill, it goes to, uh, to other places to go. At least the nuclear waste that we have is very well contained in engineered forms, in glass or cement, inside stainless steel containers that, that will then be emplaced in a properly designed repository. Okay, and Rob, you wanted to add a comment on well, the... Well, I, I, I wanted to uh, ask some questions since I've got two tame nuclear experts yeah, close at hand. Um, the first is that... Uh, there's been a bit of discussion recently about actually pulling back from the idea of burying nuclear waste because new, uh, new types of reactors could actually use that waste as fuel. Uh, so I wanted just to know to what extent that's likely to happen in you know, the foreseeable future. It seems to be a good thing to do. is like actually just consume the waste and you've dealt with a problem. Um, and also... I, I'm just guessing here, but wouldn't it be the case that there'd be more radioactive waste being emitted into the environment from coal than from nuclear at the moment? Because you know, coal is rocks, it contains a very, very small amount of radioactivity, radioactive material, um, and we burn it and it goes up a chimney, or it, you know, it ends up as ash. And um, should, you know, just because of the sheer volume of coal that we end up uh, consuming, would we end up with more radioactive waste from that? We certainly end up with lots more Lots of other kinds of waste from, for example, burning coal. Um, you know, I mean, we produce, from fossil fuels, we produce gigatons of carbon dioxide every year across the world. But uh, in terms of uh, the amounts of waste that we're producing from those processes, I wonder what your thought, thoughts were on that. Okay. Uh, who, would one of you like to answer Rob's questions and I'll see if the audience want to. Um, on, on the case of... Uh, emissions, there are uh, radioactive emissions from coal-powered plants. So if you're living in the proximity of a coal-powered fire station, you have a higher measurable dose than a nuclear-powered uh, power station. So there is some uranium in the coal, and as the coal is burnt, the uranium is released and it gets into the atmosphere. On the issue of whether we should reuse the fuel, um, that's 
um, that kind of goes into the political realm once more because uh, in the 1970s, the United States under Jimmy Carter decided to stop reprocessing their fuel. And reprocessing is the process of taking the fuel and removing the reusable uranium or plutonium. Now, when you put a fuel rod through a reactor and you take it out, only about 5% of the fuel has been burnt up. So you've still got 95% of potential energy use in that fuel rod. The controversial bit is that if you reprocess, you kind of create a waste volume of other fission products as well, which you separate from your uranium and plutonium. Reprocessing can also be more expensive if the market price of uranium is very low. So if you discover large quantities of uranium ore, then it would make more sense economically just to have a once-through fuel cycle of just using that uranium. Now, in Sweden, like I mentioned before, they have a once-through fuel cycle, so they are directly disposing of their spent fuel. But one view of that could be that they're just generating a large mineral resource of uranium, copper, and stainless steel, which is going to be held in an underground repository. If they were to go for interim, dispose, interim um, storage, that spent fuel could be revisited in the future if the uranium price increased dramatically. So we could reuse that uranium, possibly the plutonium as well, in a mixed oxide fuel. So a lot of whether you, the decision on whether you reprocess is determined by the economics and the price of the uranium ore. Sue? Yeah, I mean, I've got, uh, uh, I think, two answers to that, uh, really. I mean, one is that uh, I think it's unforgivable that we throw away a valuable energy resource without actually using as much of it as we possibly can. So from a sustainability standpoint, I would actually save the, the used fuel um, for future generations so they can use it in the new sorts of reactors that, um, that you mention. Um, however, on the other hand, um, the fact that we haven't ever disposed permanently of spent fuel um, appears to be a barrier in many people's minds um, along the lines of you don't know what to do with the waste. So my view is actually we should find a repository that can be used just to prove that it can be done. We've already decommissioned reactors here in the United Kingdom and put the, uh, the waste uh, safely, mainly at, at Sellafield for future um, disposition in a repository. We should go ahead and identify where the repository should be and open it, but leave the option to use the fuel for future generations open. Could you explain for someone like me who, who doesn't know uh, very much ab ab about how waste is dealt with. When they first, when the first plants were built and not a lot of thought was given to decommissioning, why was that? Was it because they were cavalier, um, you know, and were just sort of focused on the exciting opportunity in front of them? Or was it because they knew through their broad understanding of the mechanisms and how, uh, uh, the nuclear waste could be dealt with, that it would, be, it would all be uh, relatively straightforward to deal with? I mean, I guess, that if you want me to take that one, I'll have a go, and then John can, can too. Um, back in the, uh, the early days of nuclear energy, the primary objective was to build the stations as fast as possible to start to generate um, electricity as soon as possible. Um, and um, the choice of system that they had was one that required recycling, reprocessing of the fuel. So they didn't give, I would say, very much thought, if any at all, to the future decommissioning or waste management of the um, reactor or the, uh, or the fuel cycle. But those were conceived of in the late 1940s, early 1950s. Back in the 1950s, you know, did anybody recycle anything? because it's only started to become the, the forefront of people's psyches in the 90, late 1980s, 1990s. It's only when people have thought retrospectively about future generations and how we should manage things um, to the benefit of mankind long term and the globe mankind that we're, we've really thought about recycling, about waste management for the future and about decommissioning. Okay, but presumably, because it goes back to your point about uh, having a final disposal solution because of the worry in people's minds. And that's what I was trying to get at, is that the, the, the perception of a lot of people, including myself, would be, right, you, you, you haven't got a final disposal solution because you don't know how to do it. Um, so you've created this technology, and here's this react, radioactive waste, and yes, you know how to temporar temporarily contain it, but you don't really know, do you? You've created something so 
powerful. So, you know, so there's an immense source of energy concentrated uh, uh, in, in one place. that You actually don't know how to deal with this stuff, and that sounds a little bit scary. Well, it's not right. Um, well, I'm it's, assuming it's not right, and uh, uh, that, that you know what you're talking about. And I'm, but I want you to convince me because I think that it, it is actually for a lot of people out there. Despite what Rob said earlier, that you know, the the anxieties that people have being overdone, there is a lot of uh, suspicion around nuclear waste. It's true, and it's it's fair enough, um, but. Uh, it's a political decision, mainly, um, with some technical input as to where you actually choose to site your repository. Um, once you've chosen the site, it is easily possible to engineer the whole and the emplacements and the packages that go into it. I mean, countries like Finland and Sweden have already done that. The United States, although it didn't proceed with Nevada, has a perfectly operational waste repository down in New Mexico that takes a fair bit of its national waste. So it's a political decision, and it comes back down to, um, you know, how do you go about making the decision? And also, if you're a treasury man, why do I have to take that decision now? Because the money to pay for the disposition and disposal of the legacy is, regrettably, a government um, call and a government decision. So if I'm Treasury, I'm thinking, I'll push this decision as far out as I can because I don't want to spend the money now because it's not necessary from a safety standpoint. I'd much rather build hospitals and schools and things that are going to win me votes. So the political push to get a decision on the repository is not exactly strong. Equally, we have geology in the UK. Some geology is better than others, but none is perfect. Um, but can you see somewhere like Thetford in East Anglia, where the geology is probably better than in most places, voting to take the UK's nuclear waste? It's not a vote winner, is it? The most likely sites for uh, the UK's repository will be close to or at existing sites, like Sellafield and Dune Ray, where it can be engineered satisfactorily and the waste can be emplaced. But it's a political decision to take it for the benefit of the nation. You know, if I'm, if I'm West Cumbrian, then I'm going to want to do a really good deal with the rest of the nation to have that repository built. I'm going to want a lot of benefit to my community in terms of schools, rail links, you know, you name it. Make me a list and I'll see whether the list's long enough before I vote for it, because that's what it comes down to. Okay. Uh, any more? Can we take some more points and questions? Yes, uh, I've got a number. So that gentleman there, and then we'll come to that lady. So let's take a couple at a time. Yes, there's a gentleman just there, yeah. I think I could describe myself as a layman, unqualified in, uh, in the nuclear industry. I own a business park four miles from um, Sellafield Main Gate, and uh, my clients are um, NDA, LLWR, Washington, EDF, Veolia, Salafia Limited, and uh, I can say uh, that what I pick up, just as I say across the uh, canteen table, uh, echoes quite a lot of the things that Sue said tonight. tonight. Uh, but what still comes to mind is when I acquired this site in 1999, I bought it from a company called Nirex, uh, Nuclear Industry Research Executive who were there uh, drilling holes all over Cumbria trying to find an ideal place to store high-level nuclear waste. This was before LLWR and DRIG. Um, the government then um, decided that that was not the way and Nirex got up and disappeared back down south somewhere. Um, I acquired the site complete with you know, uh, site cat and security etc. What I've got now is I've just signed a new tenant who are drilling holes in Cumbria 12 years after Nirex spent hundreds of millions drilling holes, the same holes maybe, I don't know, uh, but, but West Cumbrians, as you say, they do want a good deal, but they welcome high level, low level, you bring it to us, we want it. Now, what are your comments? Is that a government, is that a government decision or...? Okay. Is that what we're talking about here? Okay, thank you. Can they make their minds up whether they want to do it or not? So whose decision? Yeah. Yeah. 
whose decision? I'll, I'll take another comment just so we don't run out of time and then allow the speaker to come back on uh, uh, a few questions at a time. Yes, that lady there, please. It's actually on a similar point. Um, just from sort of my own knowledge of it, which isn't exactly vast, but um, as, as I understand it, there's already been the research for the actual sites within the UK and were given permission to go ahead, I think it was with three, or at least took it to the point where they took it to the councils. And then obviously from that, a lot of um, anti-policies sprung up in certain groups. Is with, with It seems to be that we're revisiting the same thing possibly with a better solution in the sense of the way it's going to be done. So hopefully people will change their mind about it or are they just hoping that a better education on it will sort of, I think a lot of that is that it's guilty of scaremongering where people were like, no, no, we can't possibly keep that sort of thing here. And I think often it was maybe a miseducation then where are we hoping now that with more knowledge of it and knowledge of that it isn't exactly as bad as we think it is. Are they hoping that that will factor into it, that no, because they seem to be looking for the same solution? So you're sort of suggesting we're going round in circles a bit? Yes. To have already have gone, tried that route, obviously had a lot of public outcry about it, and then now, so they kind of stopped doing that, which the gentleman mentioned that the company left, they stopped doing that. But now we seem to be doing back to the same, we seem to be trying to fix the problem with the same solution. Okay, so has anything changed? Yeah. Okay, and... Is it on this theme? Um, sorry, in some ways I want to go back to um, the presentation of the, the nuclear debate and when we talked about um, uh, the need to educate people to say how um, safe the uh, nuclear possibility is. Um, and it seems that it's always presented in terms of um, health and safety and being the least uh, damaging to the environment when we forget to, that we can sell the idea of nuclear with the, the possibilities to transform um, the economy or society and, and the way we live in the future as a sort of dynamic um, way of, of, of rejuvenating society. I'm just wondering, uh, couldn't we sort of challenge the austerity mindset by talking about uh, the, the possibilities um, and, and challenge some of the sort of climate change alarmism that's uh, uh, brought up by many people that say that George Monbiot is a green activist uh, who's a recent convert to nuclear but it's very guarded and just wondering about the presentation of nuclear debate. So are you saying that uh, the fact that George Monbiot has been converted to the nuclear cause. He said yeah. it's the least worst option because it does the least harm to the environment. Yes, he still doesn't trust the buggers or something along those lines. He's not an enthusiast, he's a no. reluctant. But does, are you saying that that concerns you? Yeah, because uh, uh, I, th I think uh, the, the idea, we forget the, um, the uh, amazing discovery of uh, nuclear potential to be able to get uh, uh, energy out of rocks in the ground, something that we wouldn't have even um, known about or understood 100 years ago, is, is now offers us fantastic opportunities for the future. And um, <clears throat> going back to the idea of, um, I think someone said a few comments ago about uh, like that it's only sort of in the last generation that we've begun to think about the future and the, fu the future harm. But I think... Uh, we, we'd have always thought about the future. It's just become a, a preoccupation of a sort of risk-averse society that holds us back at the moment. OK, that's a, I think it's a very interesting question. So basically that we're failing to celebrate the, the true achievement and potential of nuclear power in this very discussion. And we're spending too much time talking about why it's needed and, and justified. Actually, we're really being far too downbeat about nuclear power. Sue? Um, I guess... That, that is, is a view that you could come to, but I think we've also got to recognise that for the best part of uh, 20, if not 30 years, um, nuclear power has been somewhat challenged from the point of view of people saying it was over-optimistic, oversold, um, the risks were understated, um, and so I guess the, the sector generally is somewhat cautious 
um, in jumping up and down saying it's uh, you know the best thing since sliced bread and we should be out there um, celebrating. Um, I mean, that's not to say we shouldn't push the benefits of nuclear more, and I think maybe you have a good point on that score in terms of both economics and therefore contribution to society in, in times of austerity, and also um, environmentally from the point of view of, of low carbon. So um, that, that is a, a fair point, and maybe we should think more about that. Um, but going back to the question from the lady in the uh, uh, third row there, um, about going round and round the boy with respect to uh, waste. I, mean, I think the, the difference this time versus uh, previous times where, yeah, the holes were drilled not too far away on the same sort of sites, was the last time it was, uh, we've, we've decided where it's going and we're now going to prove that that's where it can go uh, without any involvement or consultation of any significance. And when people aren't consulted, they tend to get pretty upset about things, um, rightly so. Um, this time around, um, they started right again from scratch to say, okay, what's all the op let's look at all the options, including shooting it into space, and come to a general consensus on a national basis with consultations being held all over the country, which were public consultations that anybody who cared enough could go and contribute to, to look at all the options, finally deciding on the fact that geological disposal um, somewhere on UK soil was the right way to do it and then to go back to the sites that were picked as being more suitable than others, and again to open up the doors to say, okay, of those areas, which communities want to even bother to engage in the debate because we might get somewhere towards finding a solution. So that's why we are where we are, because our government, like the Finnish and Swedish governments, have finally worked out that you can't do things like this without the consent of the local people where the repository would go. And so it's about finding a local consensus where people are broadly happy with the idea and willing to have it, um, probably for some contract with a nation. Okay. And, but if I understood this gentleman correctly, the, the, the Cumbrians are very keen to have it. And are they going to be allowed to? Uh, well, we'll have to see where, where the debate uh, where, and the discussions take us. Um, because, you know, even though a significant number of Cumbrians would, uh, would, would not have a problem with it, there are always a few people who don't like that answer and who will be very vociferous in their response to that suggestion. And we live in a democracy, so we have to understand and give people a chance to speak their voice. Okay. Um, right, there's a number of more questions, so I'll, I'll take some more questions and then, you know, John and Rob, you jump in uh, when you want to. This lady here uh, at the front and then the lady behind us. Sorry to make you run around, Justine. Okay, we do it in that order, that's fine. Carolyn Jones, um, I just, I'm a bit concerned about your direct comparison of accident rates in the cold. 